Happy Sunday, family. It is always a joy to see each and every one of you. Thanks for being with us on today. I'm super excited about what we're getting ready to jump into today because we are starting uh, a short three-week series entitled Bow Down, A Life of Worship. Now, this is extra special because in this teaching series, we are really going to unpack the significance of worship. It's so much bigger than just our name. Yes, we are called the Worship Center, but we're really going to get into why a lifestyle of worship is what every believer should engage in. And as we open this teaching series, I'm super excited not only because of what we're going to get into, but I'm also excited because God has blessed us in so many ways as a church family. And we have in our midst some of the greatest gifts and talents by way of worship um, really across the globe. They're in our church. They are in our house. They are a part of our team, some of the brightest minds in the worship space. And so as we planned this teaching series, I felt very strongly that you didn't just need to hear from me about worship, but we needed to create space for some of the world's best worship leaders to also weigh in on this teaching series. And so as we kick off this series, we are going to create space for one of the greatest worship leaders, singers, songwriter, producers uh, that has been impacting the globe for years, who's a part of our own family, Pastor Myron Butler, to not just lead us in worship, but to lead us in the understanding biblically of why worship is so important. So get ready, because as we kick off this amazing teaching series, Bow Down, you are going to receive the Word of God from one of the greatest worship leaders. I know I'm bragging on him a little bit, and we should, because he is that special, and he's a part of our very own family. So would you get ready to receive the Word of God now from our very own online campus pastor, part of our worship leadership team here at the Worship Center, uh, award-winning, Grammy award-winning, uh, stellar award-winning uh, singer, songwriter, and worship leader, Pastor Myron Butler. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> amen, amen. Good morning. Put those hands together one more time if you love the Lord this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I don't know about you, and, and you may be well aware, but the Spirit of the, of the Lord is in the house this morning, as He always is. So I want to encourage you. Uh, many of you might have come in in need of something. I just want to just reassure you that whatever, whatever you are in need of, it's available. It's in the room. It's available for you. You don't have to leave the same way you came. You don't have to leave broken. You don't have to leave hurting. You don't have to leave doubting because whatever you need is in this place. Why? Because the Lord is settled here. The Spirit of the Lord is settled in this place. And I count it a privilege to stand before you this morning. Amen. I uh, want to give thanks uh, to our pastor. Uh, leader and founder, Bishop Van Moody. Hey, man, can we give him a hand? <laughs> Dr. Ty and our entire staff, Pastor Aaron, the entire staff here. I am just thankful for the opportunity to stand and share. And it's my desire that as we start this sermon series, what will happen is that our understanding of what worship is will expand that it will enlarge, that it will grow, that we will not just see worship as one, at a, as a myopic, as one thing, but the length and breadth of it will increase. And what I, I, I wanted, you know, they kind of, you know, set me up because they put me up first, huh? <laughs> Amen, Brother Jamar. He's like, I didn't do anything. <laughs> Uh, but I am just thankful for the opportunity to share. I want to use uh, as a reference for this sermon series uh, that we're entering into, Bow Down, a, a Life of Worship. Say those words with me, Bow Down, 
a life of worship. And what I want to just encourage you and reassure, as I told them in the 8 o'clock service this morning, is that if there is anything in your life that is not bowed down before the Lord, you won't experience victory. I'm going to say it one more time. I know it's kind of tight to hear, but if there is any, any area in your life that is not bowed down before the Lord, you cannot experience victory. Why would you say that? Well, before we even get to our text in 1 Samuel, the fifth chapter, it speaks of Dagon and how the Ark of the Covenant was put in Dagon's temple. And uh, they left, left it there overnight. And the next morning, they came down. And what happened? Dagon had fallen flat on his face. They picked him up and they resurrected him, pick, pick, placed him up again. Second night, they got there the next morning. Dagon was falling over again and his hands and his face were broken off. What are you simply saying is that there is nothing that can stand before the presence of an almighty, all wise God. That's why we're saying that you must have a lifestyle of a bowed down posture. Your will cannot stand. Your plans, your dreams, your thoughts, none of it can stand in the way of God's presence. Bow down a life of worship. It's, it's, it, it's my desire this morning to use a, a familiar passage of scripture to kind of help us open up our understanding. And as I said earlier, I, I hope the familiarity of the passage doesn't rob us of the ability to see the revelation in it. If you could just get your Bible, our teaching notes, our sermon notes are on the app every week. Uh, but if you could go to Matthew, the 25th chapter, the 35th through the 40th verse. Matthew 25, 35 through 40. When you have it, say, I got the word. Got the word. Shout it one more time. I don't hear enough people say, I got the word. Got the word. There we go. And it reads in the NIV, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply. Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. I want you to look your neighbor square in the face and say, neighbor, our message today is serving God and others worship Beyond the song. As uh, Pastor Jeff was singing, I was excited in myself because that's one of my favorite songs. And, 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 and many of us, we have that song that when we hear it, it takes us right into Oh, okay, okay, okay. I'm not by myself. Uh, this morning, I want to submit to us that a song, music, is an expression of worship, but it is not the 
expression of worship. You, you, you see, whenever we relegate worship to our favorite song or a song that we like, then what we have is conditional worship. Because what about when they don't sing your favorite song? What about when your favorite singer has laryngitis? Hmm. Matthew, the 25th chapter, the 35th verse through the 40th verse, specifically uh, falls within the parable of the sheep and the goats. In this passage of scripture, Jesus shares a parable that fundamentally changes our understanding of worship. This passage is part of Jesus' final teachings before his crucifixion, a period where he emphasizes the kingdom of heaven and the responsibilities of his followers. Jesus addresses his disciples on the Mount of Olives, delivering what is often referred to as the Olivet Discourse. This section of teaching includes parables about preparedness, judgment, and the kingdom of God. We see a, 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 a vivid narrative uh, that depicts the final judgment. Jesus illustrates uh, the separation of the righteous, the sheep, and the unrighteous, the goats, based on their treatment of the least of these. In this context, the least of these refers to those who are hungry, Thirsty, strangers, naked, sick, or imprisoned. And Jesus' radical identification with the marginalized and the oppressed reveals that acts of service, compassion, and mercy toward others are acts of service to him directly. This teaching shifts the paradigm of worship from mere ritualistic practices to a life characterized by love, service, and tangible expressions of faith. In this passage of scripture, Jesus is speaking and teaching about the true essence of worship. Now, in everything that we've read and discussed so far this morning, you heard me mention anything about a melody, a harmony, a chord progression, a beat? Okay. But these verses, Jesus is identifying himself with the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, and those in prison. And for the purpose of this message, we want to use this passage to look at the true nature of worship and how the nature or concept of worship goes far beyond a song, far beyond your favorite song, I might add. And to understand the basic concept of worship, we must go beyond a song and understand worship as a life marked by acts of love, service, and obedience to God. Worship, in this context, is about how we live our lives and how we treat others. Mm -hmm. In our society, worship is often uh, confined or if not confined loosely uh, uh, relegated or indirectly uh, uh, connected to the musical expression within the walls of our churches we gather we sing we lift our hands we dance and these are beautiful and necessary elements of our faith however Jesus challenges us to expand our understanding of worship. He teaches us that worship is not limited to melodies and harmonies, but it is deeply rooted in our actions and interactions with others. 
Now, let's set a framework. As a, because there are many definitions and expressions of worship. Somebody say, you know, give me the definition of worship. You get a myriad of explanations and definitions. But for the sake of our time together this morning, let's just use this definition. All right? If you got your phone and you can type your notes in, just type this in. Worship or the worth-ship. Oh, my. Uh-huh. Can I just, 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 just give me two seconds right there. What is often uh, uh, happening in our church, not us, but in other churches that I've been, <laughs> is that the worship leader is, is trying to lead or uh, 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 give leadership to uh, give the people of God a space so that they can express deep or deeper worship to God. But in order to express deep worship for God, you have to have a great value of God. Your value of God is directly attached to how much you think God is worth. If he's not worth much to you, you're not going to offer him that much worship. If he's only worth conditional worship, you're only going to offer him worship when you feel like it. Worship. Okay, let me get back on task. Our definition of worship, I haven't, I haven't forgot. Worship is, take this down, the recognition of who God is, what God has done, and what we are trusting God to do. That's our baseline definition for, for today. One more time. Worship is the recognition of who God is, what God has done, and what we are trusting God to do. I got to say it one more time. Is there anything inherently musical about that definition? No. All right. Worship must ultimately be about our response to God's love, grace, and God's sovereignty. All right. I've got four points I want us to, 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 to just look at in relation to this passage in Matthew. The first is worship as service to others. Worship as service to others. When I was coming up, we would sing, you may build <laughs> great cathedrals, large or small. I know I'm dating myself. You may build skyscrapers, grand or tall. You may conquer all of the failures of your past, but only only, only what you do for Christ will last. Worship as service to others. In this passage, Jesus equates serving others with serving him directly. This perspective shifts worship from personal, individualistic activity to communal, inclusive practice. Simply put, worship is not about me. Worship is not about you. Worship is not about what I can get or what I need or what God can do for me. I submit to you that true worship is ultimately about my service to others. Worship is not self-centered in nature. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I spent the better part of my life in this position 
giving leadership as it relates to music and song service. And there are many times that people will come up to me after service and they'll say, the worship or the song service made me feel a certain way. Now, I'm not here this morning to discredit how we feel. I'm not, I don't stand before you to dis discredit or discount your emotions. Uh, but what I submit to you is that worship or that our, our feelings are no indicator of the effectiveness of worship. Let me say that one more time. Our feelings are no indicator of the effectiveness of worship. Okay? If feelings were the measuring stick, uh, then feelings become God and not the true and living God. If feelings become the, the, the measuring stick by which we measure the effectiveness of worship, then what we have done is we have, we, we, we have decreased worship to conditional emotions. Now, can I be honest? Our feelings change with the wind. One minute you, uh-huh, and the same minute you're down. Your feelings will have you feeling like you're on a roller coaster. And I submit to you that that cannot be the fundamental foundation of what true worship is. Do I have a witness in the room this morning? Can I be real? I know I'm preaching, but can, yeah, I'm on the chopping block this morning. Can I just be real with you? There's so many times that I've been in this position, singing with everything within me, sweat dripping from my face, my clothes wet. I'm singing to the power of God. God's people are being blessed. And in the moment, I don't feel a certain way. Matter of fact, there have been many times where my feelings were the exact opposite of what the people I was standing in front of perceived. But in that moment, here's the growth opportunity. In that moment, what has to take precedent in my mind is, 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 is I have to bring my will, I have to bring my body, I have to bring my thoughts, I have to bring everything under subjection to the will of God for my life and the call of God on my life so that I might be able to accomplish service to God's people. Worship as service to others, others, others. I wasn't gifted to be celebrated. I wasn't gifted to be put on a pedestal. I wasn't gifted to be admired. All of that stuff has its place. I wasn't gifted to be awarded. I was gifted for the ultimate purpose of serving God's people. Hear me today. You were uniquely designed. You were uniquely gifted. You were uniquely purposed and predestined to serve God's people. It's not about how you feel. How you feel. How you feel. How you feel. Matter of fact, just give me two seconds right there. Just give me two seconds. What the enemy of our soul will do is he will cause us to become so focused on how we feel. He will cause us to become so focused on the thing that we're going through, not to discount or discredit it, but he will cause us to make a monument or a shrine of your feelings. And what you haven't realized is you're focusing on the wrong Worship as service to others. But next, I, 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 I want you to just take this down. 
I, I want you to open up your mind to understand worship as a response to God's grace. Worship as a response to God's grace. Uh, if we could pivot just for a moment to Ephesians 2 and 8, it lets us know that we all are saved by, uh -huh, through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one, no man, uh -huh, I like the King James, no man uh -huh, should boast. With this understanding, with this understanding of worship as a response to God's grace, every morning I get up and roll up out of my bed. I understand that it is not my alarm clock. I understand that it is not my internal body clock. I understand that it wasn't just because I was tired of sleeping. I understand that it is only because of the goodness and the grace of God that I rose up out of my bed, that I have the activities of my limbs, that I am, as my grandma used to say, clothed. It is because of the grace of God uh, that, that, that I still have my right mind. It's, it's because of the grace of God that the plans of the enemy concerning my life are dead and defeated. So with this in mind, with this in mind, whether I feel it or not, I understand I'm the recipient of God's grace. Uh-huh. Am I right about it? Whether I feel feel it or not I understand that morning by morning by morning by morning new grace new mercy is extended to me undeserved unmerited I can't earn it but yet and still he showers it upon me so if daily morning by morning I receive daily I must Okay, let's dive in here a little bit. You must, we must understand that when God gives us grace in spite of us, in spite of everything there is to know about me, the nasty, the ugly, the not so desirable parts that you don't know that I try to keep covered God knowing everything, knows everything there is to know about me, and yet it still gives grace. So daily, I owe God my worship. Not just when I feel it, not just when things are going good, or not just when things are going bad and, I, and I'm in a crisis. No. Morning by morning, day after day, my response must be here is my worship. This is the correct response, a response of gratefulness to the unmerited favor we have received from God. And it's not enough to feel grateful for what God has done for us, but Personally, we must act upon and extend, here we go, grace to others. If I understand that daily God extends grace towards me, then how could I ever have difficulty extending grace to my fellow brother or sister in Christ? Extending grace to others is our mandate. Simply put, we can't receive grace and not extend grace. Give me two seconds right here. TWC, I submit to you that we can't just extend grace to people that look like us.
We can't just extend grace to people that think like us. Mm -hmm. They call that living in an echo chamber. Is that what they call it? Okay. But l l let me kind of dig in right here on this last one. We can't just extend grace to people that have the same issues we have. Mm-hmm. 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 Can I just be real? I know we were, I know we were recording. But if, God, but if God delivered you from stealing, it's easy for you to forgive uh -huh. my, my mom used to call him a thief. If God delivered you from lying, it's easy for you to extend grace to a liar. We cannot just extend grace to those that have the same issues that we have. That's called conditional grace. We are called to worship God in response to the God-given grace we receive, and then we must in like manner extend grace to those we encounter. If we're going to understand worship beyond the song, it means understanding that our acts of kindness and service to others is done in reverence and adoration to God. And we truly live out our faith, not just act it out, but live it out when we actively see Christ in the face of everyone we meet. Everyone. Everyone. Worship beyond the song. We understand worship as what? Service. To others then worship as a response to God's grace number three and I'll be out of your way soon I'm not gonna hold you long let's look at love as worship <laughs> the great commandment mm -hmm. this simplifies the essence of worship and Christian discipleship into the commandment of love as Jesus articulated in Matthew 22 37 to 39 and he has the great commandment he says love the Lord your God with all your with all your and with all your uh-huh and and there's the conjunction uh-huh learn that in English uh-huh that means there's some more and love your neighbor as yourself mm-hmm 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 love the Lord your God uh, worship begins with a deep personal love for God this love is hol holistic engaging every aspect of our being our emotions our will our thoughts our actions you see TWC it's it's the devotion that transcends mere feelings and is demonstrated through obedience reverence and a desire to honor God in all we do love the Lord your God that's number one and love your neighbor as yourself hmm my mind we know it but okay the second part of the commandment extends the concept of worship beyond the vertical. That's me and God. To the horizontal, which is me and others. Mm -hmm. Not just the vertical, me and God, but also the horizontal, me and others. Loving our neighbors as ourselves means treating others with compassion, kindness, and generosity. Compassion, kindness, and generosity. Compassion, kindness, and generosity. It's that one in the middle. Kindness. Yeah. 
We must recognize the inherent value in every person and see and respect the humanity in everyone. Okay? Looking back on our focus scripture in Matthew, this deepens the understanding of the great commandment by illustrating practical application. Pastor Myron, how do we apply this practically? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> in this passage, acts of mercy, kindness, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, giving drink to the thirsty, welcoming the stranger, caring for the sick, and visiting the prisoners are presented as direct services to Christ himself. Okay? All right? What does this show us? What does this tell us? This shows us that love is action. Can I just break it down in grandmama language? Grandmama, you say, don't just tell me you love me. Okay. It's not just words. We must, there must be some action to substantiate what we've said. True worship and love for God are reflected in our action towards others, especially those in need. Let me just say this. Worship, worship is not just a matter of personal piety. Personal piety, huh? Okay. Pastor Myron, I pray 27 hours a day. Uh, okay. <laughs> Pastor Myron, I do my soap devotion 13 times a week. I, good practices. But true worship cannot just be us hanging our hat on our personal faith practices. Worship involves actively seeking the well-being of others. Don't just stand on the sideline and just, oh, by the way, no. Actively seeking the well-being of others. Loving our neighbors as ourselves becomes an act of worship when we see Christ in the face of everyone we meet. I'm going to keep saying that because we got to get that part. Loving our neighbors as ourselves becomes an act of worship when we see Christ in the faces of everyone we meet. Serving and loving others becomes not just moral duty, but a form of worship that honors God. This, I submit to you, this is how we walk in integral worship. Our focus scripture this morning reinforces that worship cannot be separated from how we treat others. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What you mean, Pastor Meyer? You know what I mean. We can't go up in worship in the fifth heaven and then go out and be nasty to somebody. The words that's bitter and sweet can't come out the same fountain. Am I in the book? True worship cannot be separated from how we treat others. Our love for God is incomplete if it does not translate into tangible acts of love and service to our neighbors. To sum up the great commandment of love as worship, simplifies it to its core. L-O-V-E. Worship as service to others. Worship as a response to God's grace. It's kind of dive in the deep end of the pool. This will get all of us. Lastly, what I want us to look at or consider is forgiveness. Amen. 
forgiveness. A worshipful response. Forgiveness. Forgiveness involves letting go of resentment, anger, and thoughts of revenge towards someone who wronged us. <laughs> Lord Jesus. Forgiveness is a deliberate decision to release feelings of hostility towards an offender. Here it is, whether they deserve it forgiveness a worshipful response I submit to you if we allow hostility to settle bitterness will sprout up and it will impair you it will literally become an obstacle, a roadblock to you extending the forgiveness that you yourself received in the person of Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, but died for sinful man, who committed no wrong, but he bore the sins and the wrong of sinful mankind upon Calvary's cross. Viewing forgiveness as a form of worship means recognizing that when we forgive others, we are obeying God's command and reflecting his grace and his mercy. It is an act of humility and love that mirrors the forgiveness God offers us through Jesus Christ. All have sinned. How many? How many? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Born in sin, shaping in iniquity. And Christ, who knew no sin, did no wrong, gave his all for sinful man so that we might be forgiven. This allows us to view forgiveness as our worshipful response. Walk with me. Just as, as feeding the hungry or caring for the sick as seen as service to Christ, forgiving others is also service we render to Christ. Forgiveness is an action that stems from love and obedience. It is characteristic of true service to God. Forgiveness, I submit to you, is perhaps the most profound expression of mercy as it seeks to heal relationships and restore peace. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. The enemy of our soul, once again, what calls us to become so focused on the wrong that was done to us. You know what they did to you. They know what they did to you. And the enemy wants you to become so focused on that act that you never get past it. That you never grow from it. That you never realize that you never come to terms with the fact that, yeah, they did it. But we're not perfect. I'm not perfect. And just as I would desire to be forgiven, I must forgive. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. For if you forgive men their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But... As another conjunction, if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive you. So, Pastor Myron, in consideration of, of everything that you said and shared this morning, how do we live this out? How do we walk this out? 
to live a worshipful life beyond the song, a life that is bowed down before the Lord. We must see every moment and every interaction as an opportunity to express our love for God and to embody the principles of the Christian faith. That we should seek opportunities to serve the least and to reflect the love of Christ to the marginalized, the oppressed, the disenfranchised. And we do this by seeing Christ in everyone we meet. TWC, I submit to you, yes, I love song service. I love music. It's part of the call on my life. Uh, but as it relates to worship, I understand that every gift I ever had, every gift, every gift I was ever given was so that I may serve others. Father, let your, may your word be forever settled in our spirit. Father, may we leave this place seeking the opportunity, remaining available to be used of you to help someone. If I can help someone along life's path, then my living shall not be in vain. Only what you do for him will be counted in the end. Only what you do for Christ will last. God bless you.